What are a few of the most common scams today? Let's find out, starting with number seven, worse than a catfish. An anonymous man got a call from a woman named Hallie Conley from Homestead, Florida for what he thought was a little hanky-panky. Hallie invited the guy to her house, so of course he went. But it wasn't the romantic date he expected waiting for him in that homestead bedroom. Instead, there was a man named Isaiah Perez sitting in a chair with Hallie. A bit weird, but the guy apparently stayed to see how things were going to play out. But then Hallie left the room and returned with another guy named Raphael Cyprian, who was holding a firearm. Cyprian immediately threatened the man's life like it was something he just does every day. He was after the guy's cash and his Android phones. None of these items were worth his life, so fine, here's the stuff. No problem, right? The man handed over his cash and phone, but Cyprian didn't decide to let this guy off the hook. But he was able to put up a fight, get free, and call the cops. The police swooped in, and thankfully, Conley, Cyprian, and Perez were arrested. Online dating is already dangerous enough as it is these days. Some men aren't exactly the smartest and will follow a hot girl anywhere. Number six, the wild, wild east. A multi-million dollar shoplifting ring in New York and New Jersey was broken apart after a year-long investigation with police ending up right on the ringleader's doorstep. So what happened? There were these 23 people who decided to take shoplifting to a whole new level. They weren't just swiping candy bars and hairbrushes either. They were running a well-oiled, highly organized shoplifting empire. It was like Ocean's Eleven, but instead of casinos, they hit up CVS, Dwayne Reed, Rite Aid, and Ulta Beauty. These shoplifters had their own shopping catalog, like the bad guy version of an Amazon wish list. They'd roll into the stores, grab the specific items they were told to snatch, and then run out. And they weren't swiping these goods for fun. They were on a mission. After nabbing the loot, they'd bring it all back to their secret lair in Jersey City, where they'd list everything on eBay. Unsuspecting buyers, thinking they were scoring incredible deals, were actually getting stolen goodies delivered to their doorsteps. You might wonder how much these shoplifters got paid for their sticky-fingered escapades. Well, they were raking in good money to someone that does shoplifting for a living, sometimes up to $675 for a single night's work. Eventually, the Bayonne Police Department noticed a pattern in shoplifting arrests. Suspects kept mumbling about a catalog and getting paid to steal specific things. So the cops kicked into high gear, and 14 months later, they busted the whole gang. They recovered a whopping $3 million in stolen goods, froze $4.5 million in bank accounts, and arrested 11 of the 23 shoplifters, including the boss, Stephen Williams. This goes to show that you never know what's behind those too-good-to-be-true deals online. And the next time you stroll through your local pharmacy, you might give those over-the-counter meds a second glance, wondering if they've been on a wild adventure before hitting the shelves. Number five, the Facebook Marketplace Scam. You know Facebook Marketplace marketplace where you can sell your old stuff to make a quick buck or find that perfect coffee table that'll tie your living room together. Kayla Hulihan, a business owner in Australia, almost got lured into a scam not once, not twice, but four times in a single week. Kayla posted her TV for sale on Facebook and within hours she had four potential buyers. At first she was like, hey, it must be my lucky day. But all the buyers had the same script. Someone else was coming to pick up the TV and they insisted on using pay ID so their kid or partner could pick up the TV without having to pay cash up front. But it was a trap. Once the seller agreed to the payment, they'd say the transaction couldn't go through because they lacked a business pay ID account. Then they claimed to have sent extra money to upgrade the account and even sent a fake email as proof. They'd pressure the seller to refund this imaginary money, but guess what? No real cash ever landed in the seller's account. As it turns out, it wasn't just Kayla. Aussies all over were getting roped into this pay ID impersonation scam. And the numbers don't lie. In one year alone, Scam Watch reported over $260,000 lost to this type of scam. It's like a game of whack-a-mole. One person posted on Facebook Marketplace and boom, they got the scammy messages. Another tried Gumtree, same story. So here's the golden rule, folks. If someone asks you to transfer money so they can give it back to you, your scam radar should be screaming like a fire alarm on steroids. Fortunately, Kayla didn't fall for the scam, but used her story to warn others. Number four, the strange DM. 
gems. One day, Ramona Mihalachi, a celebrity hairdresser, received a seemingly innocent direct message from a friend. The friend asked for a favor, to endorse a flower shop as part of an online vote. Ramona, being the kind soul she is, didn't think twice. She clicked on the link, thinking she was doing a good deed. But that innocent looking link was like opening a cursed pharaoh's tomb. Within moments, scammers had infiltrated Ramona's Instagram account. They started posting stories that touted the wonders of Bitcoin mining and claimed she had turned 2,000 pounds into 20,000 pounds in just three hours of trading. And her 700 followers, including big shots like TV presenter Susanna Reid and models strutting their stuff at London Fashion Week. Ramona only realized the horror when her friends started reaching out, congratulating her on her newfound Bitcoin fortune. She tried to log into her Instagram account, but her password had been changed. As desperation set in, she reached out to Instagram's customer support for help. Ramona got a message on WhatsApp that seemed to be from Instagram support, but it actually was the scammers using the Instagram logo to trick her. They said they were going to help her recover her hacked account, and she believed them. So they asked for verification codes and her ID, which she willingly handed over. The scammers had now infiltrated her email addresses and even her bank account, and they were changing all her personal details. It was a digital heist in progress. In the end, she managed to secure her account and avoid financial disaster, but the emotional toll was undeniable. So the next time a link pops up, even if it's from a close friend, take a minute, ask yourself if it's legit, and remember, the internet can be a dangerous place. Number three, the postage scam. Now we're gonna go down under. Picture this, you're eagerly waiting for a package, that online shopping haul you've been daydreaming about. You've been refreshing your tracking updates more times than you'd like to admit. Finally, you get a text message, but it's not what you were hoping for. Your shipment, it says, has failed, and they need you to update your shipping address. Panic sets in, your precious package is in limbo. Now, before we go any further, let us introduce you to an unnamed savvy online shopper from Sydney. She's just a regular person like any of us, scrolling through her phone, phone, tracking her beauty products, but she almost got caught in the spider web of a scam. She received this text message from the Australia Post that seemed legit. There was an online link, she clicked on it, and she ended up on a website that looked exactly like the official Australia Post site. It asked for an updated address, and she happily filled it in. But then came the curveball. A second page popped up asking for her credit card details. Red flags, anyone? The website said there's a re-delivery fee. The woman was just about to give away her precious credit card info when fate intervened. Her package arrived on her desk. At that moment, she really realized how close she came to being scammed. She thought she was immune to these scams and who could blame her? The text looked authentic. The website seemed like the real deal and she was expecting a delivery. The scam is becoming more and more common. So the Australia Post wants you to remember one thing. They'd never ever contact you via SMS or email asking for personal or financial information or payments. So if you're from down under and get a text asking for that credit card number, it's a scam. And that sneaky website? Well, the devil's in the details. Always check the web address, especially at the bottom. If it looks fishy, swim away. Number two, Snapchat Honey Trap. Imagine a seemingly innocent Snapchat exchange between two folks. Well, let's call them Jack and Lauren. They were just having some fun, sharing the occasional spicy pic. The kind of stuff you'd think vanishes in the digital abyss, right? Well, when it comes to the internet, nothing is ever truly gone. Lauren, a Snapchat user, decided to take things to a whole new level. She'd been swapping some explicit photos with Jack, creating a virtual bond through screens. But then, out of the blue, she pulled the plug on their virtual romance. But instead of just ending things, Lauren unleashed the beast, blackmail. She demanded cash from Jack, not just a little. She wanted his family inheritance money. Lauren threatened to send those intimate pics to Jack's family and plaster them all over social media. Terrified and cornered, Jack started shelling out the dough. He borrowed from friends, dipped into his family's inheritance, and even took out a payday loan. The total damage? Over 28,000 pounds. And this went on for nine months. Lauren even invented a fictional boyfriend named Liam who played the role of the villain, demanding cash to keep those pics locked away. Eventually, Jack was left high and dry, financially drained, and emotionally scarred. The toll this took on him was unbelievable. It almost makes you wonder what was in the photos that Jack was willing to spend that much on to keep private. Remember folks, in the digital age, those pics are like a double-edged sword. They can cut both ways. Or maybe we should just all agree to do away with social media entirely. Does anyone actually like it? Besides, it seems like it has done far more harm than it has good. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how sometimes it's the people who are in your own household scamming you.
Number one, new device added. A businesswoman named Savannah Jackson in Queenstown, New Zealand, learned the hard way that even the most vigilant person can slip up. Savannah is your typical hyper-aware type when it comes to sketchy texts and scams. She's the one who'd spot a fake email from a mile away. Well, usually. But one fateful day, while juggling work and life, she got a text from her bank, BNZ. The message was one of those just to confirm a new device has been added to your account messages. So she clicked on the link. It looked official, but it was not. Within minutes, her entire business account, a whopping $42,000, vanished into thin air. All her hard-earned money for staff, wages, bills, and taxes, gone. Savannah realized her mistake almost immediately and called the bank in a panic, but they said it was too late. The money already hopped into the hands of a third-party company named Wise, and there was nothing she could do about it. Two weeks later, Savannah was in the middle of a battle to reclaim her money. She was on the phone with BNZ Daily, demanding updates on the staff status of the investigation, and it doesn't look like Savannah is going to get her money back. How can a major bank like BNZ and their fraud department not get through to a major international funds transfer company, she wondered? It's a question that leaves us scratching our heads too. You'd think these big players would have a direct hotline, right? Let's be crystal clear about one thing. Your bank will never send you an email or text message with a link to log in or ask for your account details. As with any scam, you're always going to be your first and best line of defense. So stay vigilant and educate yourself as much as you can. The latest Netflix true crime miniseries is called Worst Roommate Ever, and it'll make you rethink the severity of all your horrible roommate experiences. Instead of focusing on one criminal for the entire series, like in The Tender Swindler or Bad Vegan, Worst Roommate Ever focuses on a new criminal per episode. Episode 3, Marathon Man, is about a Texas woman named Callie Quinn who moved to Chile in 2011. Little did she know that her new roommate, Youssef Halter, was a serial fraudster. Some of his crimes included scamming Palestinian charities, stealing money from his housemates, and even trying to bury Callie alive. He only served 602 days in jail before being sent to Denmark in 2014 where he served another three months. Once out, Youssef adopted several fake identities to keep scamming people. But this was just the beginning. Youssef's story runs much deeper than you could ever imagine. There are two sides to every coin. In this instance, the coin is the relationship between Youssef and Kali. Youssef was the oldest of the housemates. He identified as a Palestinian, born in Israel, but raised in Denmark. After spending a few years in the Palestinian Special Forces, he moved to Chile under the Federation Palestine de Chile, an organization representing Chile's largest Palestinian population, the largest outside of Palestine. As an impressive athlete, the organization sponsored Youssef to break the world record running the 2,653-mile length of Chile. Youssef told his housemates about his intense physical training with the Danish Special Forces during meals and downtime. That training included standing in a room full of mace or swimming to the bottom of a 40-foot deep pool. Two of the housemates, Ed and Sabi, loved listening to his stories. Callie just rolled her eyes. Callie was a bright-eyed girl who moved to Chile for her love of travel, sense of adventure, and the easy visa process. She taught English and moved into a 12-bedroom house that seemed more like a hostel. She became friends with all her housemates, except for Youssef, who complained that she talked too much. But even Callie had to admit that Youssef seemed like an impressive guy. When one of his friends or housemates got sick, he would run to the grocery store to make them a vitamin C smoothie. He gave away the sportswear he received from his Sponsors, administered free acupuncture to friends, and gathered his housemates for random movie nights with chocolate. Kali was starting to come around to Yusef. According to Yusef, he was born to a hard-working mother and a cruel father. Yusef was one of five children. In school, he was a popular, athletic kid who began running marathons at 11. When his parents separated, he joined the Danish infantry at 18 and became one of the few selected for the special forces. But he was a wanted man in Denmark. Even after charges were brought against him with plenty of evidence, Yusef maintained his innocence with the stone-cold demeanor of a psychopath. One day, Yusuf mentioned to Callie that he had just bought two new condos downtown and offered to rent them out to her and another housemate, Molly. He offered them a low price, and they accepted for just $1,000, which included the first month's rent and security deposit. The day before move-in, 
Callie set up a meeting with Yusef to get the keys to her new place. Yusef arrived late to their meeting because he was apparently planning a search and rescue mission for three Danish women stranded in the Atacama Desert. Pretty noble, huh? Yusef invited Callie out for dinner after and was surprised to find that she enjoyed his company. When their housemate Sabi called him, Callie could hear that she was upset. Yusef owed Sabi money and hadn't paid her back for several months. He promised to send the money back to the house with Callie. During dinner, Yusef talked about a house that burned down in town that apparently had a golden toilet. He suggested they go and find it, and Callie agreed. They snuck into the burnt home, and as soon as Callie saw the regular beige toilet seat, she turned to leave. She had to be up early for work the next day, and it was already getting late. Then, Yusef attacked her. He went on and on about owing people money and that it was all Callie's fault. Callie passed out and Yusef left her there, never expecting her to return. A frantic Sabi was nervous because Callie hadn't answered her calls in hours. Callie was supposed to be bringing home the money Yusef owed her, nearly $1,000. She heard Yusef come home and start knocking on everyone's doors, asking if they'd seen Callie. Another housemate, Ed, suddenly saw Callie in her long puffy coat in the distance. He and Yusef ran outside. Callie began yelling at Yusef immediately, asking how he could do that to her. Sabi and Molly saw Callie's wounded head and called a cab to the hospital. Callie told them everything. After Yusef left her unconscious, Callie dreamed her family was screaming at her to wake up. She finally snapped awake to find she'd been wrapped in a tarp, stuffed in a closet, and buried beneath a foot of ash. Molly and Ed wanted to believe her but thought she must have been confused. Yusef could never do something like that. Ed and Sabi returned to the house. Yusef pretended to be sympathetic when they described what happened to Callie, but denied the attack. Yusef told Molly that his mother had died in the middle of the night and he needed to go back to Denmark. He disappeared without a trace. The next day, Callie woke up still coughing up ash. She had Molly file a police report on her behalf. A man came to take Callie's information, but she had difficulty remembering the entire story. To outsiders, it didn't make sense. If Yusef tried to hurt her, why weren't there bruises on her neck? Why would he get violent over such a small sum of money? The report noted the incident as a dispute between two foreigners. In the meantime, Molly tried to get in touch with Callie's family. Finally, she reached her brother John on Facebook. Callie's parents received word of the attack and Skyped with their injured daughter. They wanted to hop on a plane and see her, but Callie said no. She couldn't risk it with Yusef still on the loose. But this is only the midpoint of Yusef's story. Let's go back to the beginning. Carlos Medina was a member of the Federación Palestina and an avid Chilean soccer fan. Medina and his friend Carlos Kraus helped raise $8,000 to sponsor Yusef in the Atacama race, a 155-mile race through the Atacama Desert in Chile. Medina and Kraus were excited to show a different side of the Palestinian people. But on the second day of the race, Yusef dropped out, saying that the marathon organizers noticed a tear in his leg and forced him to exit the course. Yusef said it was racially motivated, so Medina and Kraus took Yusef to get the tear examined by a doctor and prove wrongdoing. When the diagnosis came in, no muscle tear, Yusef stopped responding to their texts and calls. Medina and Kraus contacted Yusef's friend, Dominic Rayner, a fellow marathon from England who said Yusef owed him money. Rayner previously bought him $12,000 worth of Under Armour gear and paid $38,000 to purchase properties in Brazil that Yusef suggested they could invest in together. The real estate broker kept giving excuses for why he couldn't send Raynar a receipt and then accidentally signed one email as Yusef. Rayner demanded his money, and Yusef gave him two options. The money could be wired to him, or he could come to Chile and get it. Rayner decided to meet Yusuf at the airport in Chile, but of course, Yusuf was nowhere to be found. Twelve hours later, Yusuf met Rayner in the city and took him on a walk to show him where he was living. It was the house that Callie would move into two weeks later. The next day, Yusuf took him on a three-hour hike to the city's outskirts where their lawyer worked. At one point, Rayner dropped down to tie his shoe. Then, Yusuf charged at him with a walking stick and struck him. Yusuf charged at Rayner and was about to take his life when he noticed two people watching nearby. He pushed Rayner into a ditch and urged him not to tell anyone what happened. He told Rayner that he spent all his money, a total of $55,000. Rayner left Santiago the next day and filed a report with the British Metropolitan Police Service and Interpol. No one knew where Yusef was hiding. 
Criminal attorney Rocco Berrios heard Medina, Rayner, and Callie's stories and wanted to track down Yusuf. It seemed like everywhere he went, money disappeared. He stole cash from a friend's bag and blamed the hostile owner. Then he persuaded a Norwegian athlete to invest $10,000 in property in Brazil and then stole the cash. He even convinced people in Denmark to transfer $28,000 to purchase flights and then kept the money for himself. Yusef's crime spree was documented across Denmark. Though arrested in 2009 for several of his crimes, he failed to appear in court for his trial in January 2011. He was still wanted for arson, embezzlement, forgery, and fraud. Palestinian activist Mahar Khatib heard about Yusef's crimes and was furious at how he was damaging the reputation of the Palestinian people. After tons of research, he found Yusef's sister on Facebook, who was a lawyer in Copenhagen. As soon as she picked up the phone, she started crying, saying that Yusef had destroyed her entire family's lives. Not only that, but he created an entire web of lies. He wasn't born in Haifa. He was born in Beirut. He wasn't even Palestinian. He was Lebanese. Berrios communicated all of this to Yusef's victims via email. Together, they figured out the perfect plan. They discovered that Yusef had just written to his ex-girlfriend asking for money for an arm and leg amputation. If she wired him the money, the police could get him when he picked it up. But the night before the transfer, Yusef told his ex he was sending a Taiwanese sponsor named Lin Chai Min to pick up the cash instead. Officers tracked Chai Min to a Chile Express money agency where they found Yusef sitting in the car and arrested him. Two days before Callie's 24th birthday, she received an email from Berrio saying, we got him. But still, he denied attacking Kelly. A psychologist saw him at Santiago Uno jail, awaiting trial without bail. After many tests and interviews, Yusef admitted to striking Kelly in the head, but said he never intended to hurt her. He just wanted to confuse her into thinking he had returned her condo deposit. The psychologist said that Yusef displayed narcissistic, paranoid, and asocial traits. He lacked empathy and used his friends. He showed many of the classic psychopathic traits. He was charismatic, egotistical, promiscuous, and a liar. Most importantly, he had no conscience. Yusef was basically out of prison in three years between his sentences in Chile and Denmark. In Chile, there are two kinds of attempted murder charges. One is for those who try to hurt someone and fail. The other is for one who have a plan and then abort the mission. The latter carries a much softer penalty. Berrios believed Yusef was guilty of the first charge, but tried to prove the second because the witnesses, aka Callie's old housemates, were scattered around the world and couldn't testify. On the other hand, Yusef's attorney believed he could win him a short sentence because he was a first-time offender in Chile. Berrios showed the judge Yusef's criminal record from Denmark, but it had little effect. The judge sentenced Yusef to 541 days for attempted murder and 61 days for fraud. Yusef, however, had already served more than half of his sentence while awaiting trial. After prison in Chile, he was extradited to Denmark, facing five more charges. Unfortunately, they acquitted Yusef of three charges and released him three months later. One September day, Callie received an email from Berrios with a link to a news article about Yusef. He apparently fled to Costa Rica, where he met a Canadian traveler named Sheena Taylor and scammed her out of $19,000. Taylor was a down-on-her-luck single mother, and Yusef was just what she needed. He held a birthday party for her daughter, brought her breakfast in bed, and took her shopping. But there were some red flags, like when Yusuf said he could leave her in the jungle and nobody would find her, or when he pressed a pillow to her face. But she looked past these things because of the happiness Yusuf brought her. Hmm. One day, Yusuf never returned to their room in the hostel. A concerned tailor went to the bank only to discover that someone had drained her bank account. Yusuf took her bank card and memorized her pen. All her savings were gone. When he arrived in Capos, Costa Rica the previous June, Yusuf adopted the alias Joseph Carter so no one discovered his real identity. He asked a Texan-born store owner, Todd Flanders, to spot him for $3,500 of Under Armour clothes, promising that his sponsors would reimburse him later. Flanders was known around the town of Capos for his incredible generosity and big personality. When Yusef told Flanders that thieves stole $10,000 from him, Flanders agreed to spot him during a tough time. The two 
became friends and went to a boxing gym together. When Flanders told Yusef that he was getting divorced and fighting for custody of his children, Yusef offered to help by getting a hold of second-hand cell phones that Flanders could sell at his shop and use the profits for legal fees. But the cell phones never arrived, and neither did the money from Yousef's sponsors. Taylor found Flanders by tracing one of Yousef's sportswear packages. Taylor and Flanders started piecing together Yousef's story through Danish and Chilean newspaper articles. When Flanders confronted Yousef on WhatsApp, he stopped responding. Flanders and Taylor reported Yousef to Costa Rica's FBI. But just like Callie's case, they dismissed Yousef's activities as disputes between foreigners. When Callie heard about this, she was heartbroken. After everything she went through, Yousef was still at it, destroying people's lives. Callie emailed Taylor, who never responded. Then Callie found out that Flanders took his own life after losing one daughter and a fierce custody battle for the others. Still, Yousef roams free. Callie imagined him walking the streets of Costa Rica, charming women and swindling strangers. But Digital Spy reported that Yousef moved to Nicaragua in 2019, where he served a few months for fraud and was extradited back to Denmark. He probably started life under a new name and will do it all over again. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section whether or not you think social media platforms will still be around in 100 years.